So thank you everyone for joining us. I'm so excited for this event. I'm so excited that y'all y'all can be here today and so excited for our guests, uh, Etienne Toussaint and Bennett Capers and our fantastic moderator and fellow Iltaf Bala. So I'll turn it over to them in a second. Um, but I just wanna sort of uh, situate this event a little bit to say that you know we're really excited at the initiative for representative first amendment where i'm the director to sort of host events that sort of push our thinking of what constitutes the realm of the first amendment um, and that's one of the reasons i'm so excited um, to have this conversation today um, that's focused on sort of policing and the future of policing specifically thinking from sort of an afrofuturist lens on um, how that blackness sort of experiences of blackness more generally interact with the ways in which policing regulates our our lives and our and our speech. Um, so with that, you know, I'm going to turn it over to our fantastic guests and uh, get out of the way. Um, but we're so excited to have uh, Iltaf, um, who's one of our, our fellows and a, now I guess a rising 2L at Case Western Reserve University School of Law um, and working, spending her summer at um, the Ber uh, Berkeley, hopefully learning all kinds of cool things about both the First Amendment and tech and policing, um, who will be sort of uh, moderating our conversation, uh, asking some questions, and then about, you know, probably with 15 minutes left, we'll sort of turn over to audience Q&A. So, yep, thank you. Thank you again for joining us and Iltaf, take it away. Hello, everybody. So I'm really excited to be here having this conversation with y'all. We got a lot of interesting discussions planned, so I'll just go ahead and jump on right to it and introduce our special guest. So first, we have Professor Etienne Toussaint. He was born and raised in the South Bronx, and is an assistant professor of law at the University of South Carolina School of Law starting this fall, where he teaches various business law courses. His scholarship employs critical race theory and social and political philosophy to study community development, economic and environmental justice, contract law and legal history. He has a developing interest in the intersection of the First Amendment and critical race theory inspired by the Trump administration's violent response to the Black Lives Matter protests this last summer. He previously taught at UDC, Davis A. Clark School of Law, and at the George Washington University Law School. Professor Toussaint is also a graduate of MIT where he earned a degree in mechanical engineering and he went on to get a master's in environmental engineering at the Johns Hopkins University and his JD at Harvard Law School. And today we'll be discussing his piece, Blackness is Fighting Words. So please welcome Professor Toussaint. And next up, we have Professor Capers. So in fall 2020, he joined Fordham Law School where he teaches evidence, criminal law and criminal procedure. Uh, he's also the director of the Center on Race, Law and Justice uh, he's a former federal prosecutor and his academic interests include the relationship between race, gender, technology, and criminal justice. Um, his articles and essays have been published or are forthcoming in, and this is a lot, so hold on tight, the California Law Review, twice, uh, the Columbia Law Review, Cornell, Fordham, Michigan, Minnesota, NYU, and the UCLA Law Review, among others. Um, he has thrice been voted Teacher of the Year and is an elected member of the American Law Institute, uh, Director of Research for the Uniform Laws Commission, and has served as Chair of the AALS Criminal Justice Section of, and Chair of the AALS Law and Humanities Section. Um, Governor Cuomo has appointed him to serve on the Judicial Screenings Committees, and he's also served for several years as Commissioner on the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board. He is the author of Afrofuturism, Critical Race Theory, and Policing in the Year 2044. So please welcome Professor Capers. And it would be great for both of you to give a brief background on your piece so everyone gets kind of an idea of what they're about. And with this, we'll start with Professor Toussaint and then we'll go back to the future and have Professor Capers talk about his piece before we move on to the questions. Fantastic. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to join this distinguished panel at my alma mater alongside my dear brother, Professor Bennett Capers, uh, who is a true role model for me personally, and also a tremendous asset to the academy on issues of race, criminal law, and social justice. 
I'm humbled to have this opportunity to share a few insights from my essay, Blackness as Fighting Words, in which I explore the, the issue of police violence during peaceful public protests through the lens of the First Amendment. Um, if I were to summarize the focus of the exploration in a single sentence, it would be this. Are there aspects of the First Amendment to the US Constitution that legitimate, promote, or in the worst case, justify police violence during their encounters with public protesters? Uh, let me begin by describing my own introduction to fighting words. Where I grew up in the South Bronx, the wrong words could turn an innocent sparring match on the playground into a full out asphalt brawl. We were naive young black boys enacting tropes of hypermasculinity. So often we would form a circle around the contenders laughing as they hurled jokes back and forth about athletic ability or sneaker selection. But inevitably, as soon as someone uttered that dreaded phrase, your mama, the playful exchange always took a turn for the worst. We all knew there was no turning back at that point. In the Bronx, the phrase, your mama was fighting words. As a black youth roaming New York City in the 1990s, mastering the nuances of such fighting words is critical to maintaining friendships and keeping potential enemies at bay. However, during the presidency of Donald Trump, fighting words has seemingly taken on new meaning. Whereas the fighting words of my youth reflected bruised egos and differences of opinion, the fighting words of Donald Trump have normalized racist, sexist, homophobic, and xenophobic rhetoric that too often has fanned the flames of violence, especially between citizens and police. The resurgence of protests by Black Lives Matter activists and their rallying cry, Black Lives Matter, has ushered a global reckoning with uh, the meaning of this violence. This project then considers the implications of this generation's acclamation of Black humanity amidst the social tensions exposed during COVID-19. What has the Trump administration's militarized response to public protest meant to a world still battling the scars of racial oppression, a wound laid bare by America's racially biased, aggressive, and supervisory culture of policing? I would argue that Black identity itself, or Blackness, whether articulated by the pure speech of racial justice activists who affirm Black humanity, or embodied by the symbolic speech, of Black bodies assembled in collective dissent in the public square has become fighting words in the consciousness of America, a type of public speech unprotected by the Constitution. What do I mean by fighting words? Well, let me begin by clarifying a few points about the contours of freedom of speech in the United States. In 1989, U.S. Supreme Court Justice William Brennan declared in Texas v. Johnson that if there is a bedrock principle under the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. Since 1791, white citizens of America have been empowered to peacefully march and demonstrate on public lands to petition the government for redress of grievances. However, the Constitution and its Bill of Rights have maintained a complex relationship with its minoritized citizens, beginning with the Africans who were enslaved as the chattel of many of the Constitution's writers and continuing with their descendants who frequently live as nominally free but substantively second-class citizens. Prior to the Civil War, enslaved Africans were prohibited from assembling for education, for leisure, for worship, or for collective expressions of dissent in the public square. Slave patrols, precursors to modern American policing that comprise white men deputized to prevent rebellions by stopping any enslaved people who happen to be on the roads, searching them and preventing them from congregating, enforce these slave codes. When uprisings of the enslaved occurred, Black men and Black women were met with lashings, lynchings, and ultimately legal holdings that sought to perpetuate and justify their debasement. Yet even after slavery was abolished by the 13th Amendment, Black codes were enacted across the United States to restrict the freedom of Black citizens, from restrictions on their right to assemble for leisure to restrictions on their right to assemble for public protest. Although Black Americans were granted access to the Constitution's Bill of Rights during the Reconstruction era, the rise of racial terrorism in the form of the Ku Klux Klan, coupled with the refusal of law enforcement to protect Black lives from the Klan's acts of violence, stifled the First Amendment rights of Black people. As scholars such as Brandon Hasbrook have argued, America's modern system of law enforcement then emerges as a badge and incident of slavery. In our modern age, little has changed as we've all seen as the constitutional rights of black and other minoritized protesters has 
increasingly come under attack. So where do fighting words come into play? It is important to remember that the rights granted by the First Amendment to the Constitution are not unconditional. And here I wanna drop a footnote for later discussion because the notion of what rights citizens should be granted by the state or what rights are inherent and should be recognized as absolutely central to the critical race, to critical race theory and the Afrofuturist project. In the United States, while the federal government cannot generally regulate speech based on its content, it can enact reasonable content neutral restrictions on its time, place, and manner. Additionally, some categories of speech are given limited or no protection under the First Amendment. For example, some kinds of speech are considered so harmful, so injurious by themselves, their very utterance tending to incite an immediate retaliation or breach of the peace that they are deemed outside of the Constitution's protection. Such words are called fighting words. Uh, the fighting words doctrine originated in 1942 in the case of Chaplinsky v. New Hampshire. Mr. Chaplinsky, a Jehovah's Witness, drew several complaints from the residents of Rochester, New Hampshire, after defaming various religious sects while proselytizing. After calling the city marshal a, quote, goddamn racketeer and a, quote, damn fascist, end quote, Chaplinsky was arrested and convicted under a state law that made it a crime to address any offensive, derisive, or annoying word to any other person who was lawfully in any street or other public square. Chaplinsky appealed his conviction and challenged the law, arguing that the city ordinance violated his freedom of speech under the First Amendment. However, in a unanimous opinion, the Supreme Court held that Chaplinsky's, quote, fighting words incited an immediate breach of the peace, and consequently, they were deemed unprotected speech under the First Amendment's freedom of speech clause. The court considered Chaplinsky's words, quote, of such slight social value that any benefit that may be derived from them was clearly outweighed by the social interests in order and morality, end quote. Although Chaplinsky has never been overruled, the Supreme Court narrowed its scope in later decisions. Still in matters involving public protest toward the perceived racist actions of police officers, the Fighting Words Doctrine raises important questions about the limits of constitutional protection for black and other minoritized citizens. Some courts have overturned convictions based upon local laws prohibiting the interruption of policing work with offensive language, affirming a sense that the First Amendment protects a significant amount of verbal criticism and challenge directed at police officers. However, other courts have held that public expressions of dissent to law enforcement can constitute fighting words. Even more, some state and local governments have responded to such concerns by simply limiting the range of public speech that can be criminalized to only include fighting words effectively granting police officers discretionary authority to determine what kinds of activities or public speech amount to criminal conduct. In other words, legislatures have bypassed wrestling with the racial tensions uh, between law enforcement and minoritized communities by avoiding acknowledgement of the prevalence of implicit racial bias among police officers altogether. Rather than question why police officers routinely use pepper spray, tear gas, rubber bullets, and other violent policing tactics in response to peaceful public protests about racial injustice, the doctrine threatens to publish people who anger police officers with their free speech. As a result, in my opinion, a sense of confusion remains, especially regarding public speech that decries racism at the hands of the police. Could the phrase Black Lives Matter and similar expressions of speech that affirm the dignity of Black lives or decry the injustice of institutional racism be deemed fighting words by police officers because they disturb the peace. Here I will assert a second footnote. Both critical race theory and the Afrofuturist lens would urge us to question, what do we mean by peace and for whom? The difficulty that courts have faced in determining whether the Constitution protects public protests of perceived racist policing suggests to me that the notion of anti-racist speech as fighting words is still up for debate. Perhaps one reason for such ambiguity arises from the very concept of disorderly conduct, which I would argue is an inherently racist idea in the United States. When anti-racist speech threatens the commonplace nature of police supervisory authority, even when delivered in response to unjustified yet ubiquitous police aggression, it is reasonable to presume that police officers will perceive such language as fighting words that incite an immediate breach of the hierarchical social order. 
Another reason for the ambiguity of anti-racist speech as fighting words arises from the criminalization of disobedience to police orders. Not only do citizens struggle to determine when policing tactics are lawful, but they also face the risk of bodily harm or even worse death if they disobey a police order to challenge perceived unlawful conduct. Further, civil rights lawsuits alleging violations of constitutional rights by police officers must confront, as we all have learned, the blue wall of silence, the weaponry of indemnification policies and police unions, and the protective shield of the qualified immunity defense. Maybe it is the very idea of blackness as something other than property that becomes fighting words in the eyes of American exceptionalism, a type of symbolic speech so harmful to white supremacy, so capable of inciting imminent lawless action, so disruptive of border maintenance policing that it is deemed a peril to the veil of white supremacy that looms over the American constitutional order and consequently is prohibited from the public square. Maybe this explains why police officers arrive to BLM protests with guns and tanks and shields and gas long before the first stone has been thrown or the first rallying cry has been sung. The very utterance of the phrase Black Lives Matter tends to incite imminent violence and unbridled rage from police in the city streets across America because if Black Lives Matter, if Black Lives truly matter, well, so much of our so-called social order must be called into question. Yet the words Black Lives Matter and the peaceful assembly of protesters also encapsulates the righteous indignation of minoritized citizens. Discussions of Black Lives Matter by activists and scholars evoke what Cornell West calls the prophetic pragmatism of the Black radical tradition. Here I would drop a third footnote. If CRT reveals our current version of political economy as merely a genre of modernity, one shaped by a Western conception of what it means to be human, then in an Afro-futurist discourse about liberty, we must ask, what does it mean to be free? This dynamic to me reflects unresolved tensions in the First Amendment's treatment of race relations in America. Such tensions, masked by seemingly neutral constitutional constructs, rationalize the iron fist of the penal state in response to peaceful public protests, smothering the constitutional rights of Black and other minoritized citizens by legitimating violence not to quell social disruption, but rather to reinforce social control. In closing, I believe these racial tensions in the First Amendment reveal three insights that are important to the ongoing discourse on policing in America. Uh, first, unresolved racial tensions in the First Amendment, focusing here on ambiguities in the fighting words doctrine, perpetuate the racially biased, aggressive, and supervisory culture of American policing. Such challenges are laid bare when peaceful assemblies of BLM protesters who petition the government for redress of racial grievances are deemed disturbances of the peace by police officers and met by violence police force. Actions that implicate the fighting words doctrine and call into question the contours of unprotected speech. Importantly, such discretionary authority reveals the misplaced focus of the fighting words doctrine or the first amendment more generally on the inability of the recipient of fighting words to restrain themselves from violence and not on the actual substance of the words spoken. This framing renders the police officer as, as judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to interpreting the meaning of black and brown protest speech. Second, such unresolved tensions in the First Amendment as conveyed by a racially biased and aggressive police culture cast a dark shadow over the liberty of black and other minoritized citizens who experience racism at the hands of police, yet avoid acts of protest for fear of bodily harm or arrest, resulting in a chilling effect on free speech. To be sure, modern courts rarely enforce convictions based on the usage of fighting words to disturb the peace. Notwithstanding, does the existence of a legal regime that threatens to criminalize anti-racist public speech if it harms its target and incites an immediate breach of the peace, even if such arrests are routinely unenforced by courts, constitute a culture of suppression that silences dissent with fear of police retaliation? A rule of law driven by fear of the police not only distorts the ideals of liberty that underscores liberal democracy, but it is also eerily reminiscent of the culture of slave patrols that threaten the lives of defiant Black Americans in antebellum America. 
Third and finally, unresolved racial tensions in the fighting words doctrine illuminates the embeddedness of racism in American policing culture more generally. As critical race theorists have taught us, this culture not only constructs and reconstitutes the social order by perpetuating stereotypes of minoritized communities as sites of disorder that require constant supervision, but it also degrades the dignity of black and minoritized Americans by treating them as second-class citizens unworthy of private autonomy while hindering the broader policing goal of minimizing crime. If I could ask one question of Afrofuturists, it would be this, what does human dignity mean in a future version of these United States that has been wrested away from a racist, misogynist, and settler colonialist vision of human being? Taken together, I think these insights suggest that until we as a nation wrestle with the racial subtext of modern policing, a culture woven into law that silences the public protests of citizens in violation of their First Amendment rights and rationalizes violence at the hands of law enforcement, Black America will remain at peril to the veil of white supremacy that looms over the American constitutional order. Importantly, I'll note this is not a call to transgress race or usher in an era of post-Blackness. In other scholarship, I note the importance of embracing the cultural specificity of Blackness to dislodge the perceived neutrality of whiteness, nor is this an attempt to essentialize black identity or black performativity as something to be pitied. As Professor Imani Perry eloquently retorted, I must turn the pitying gaze back upon any who offer it to me because they cannot understand the spiritual ma majesty of joy and suffering. Rather and simply, this project for me seeks to bear witness to the absurdity and perversity of state-sponsored violence at any and all affirmations of Black humanity and beckons America to a moral reckoning, a willingness to embrace anger, embrace rage, embrace the normality of fighting words and use it as a catalyst for change. So I suppose I'm up next. So I, I want to start off by uh, thanking Kendra and the other organizers for inviting me and Iltal for that great introduction. And I just have to say, I'm so excited to be in conversation with Etienne and his exploration of Blackness as fighting words. Um, I will say in full disclosure, I'm not a First Amendment person, I'm a policing person, but just being at this event, <laughs> has gotten me thinking more about the intersections between the First Amendment and policing. So uh, for some years now, I have been uh, thinking and writing about uh, police technologies, especially with respect to their potential to make policing more efficient and transparent, and also their potential to deracialize policing and make it more egalitarian. So my plan today is to revisit some of my thinking um, and build upon it. So specifically, I want to build upon the uh, article I wrote, uh, it feels like a decade ago, I guess it was just a few years ago, <laughs> titled Afrofuturism, Critical Race Theory and Policing in the Year 2044. So that project was inspired by projections that by the year 2044, the United States will tip from being majority white to being majority minority. Um, so the project sort of allowed me to ask what the future could look like in 2044 when people of color make up the majority. And really in the ensuing years when people of color obtain political and economic power to sort of match their numerical power. And more specifically, how could some of the problems we've been wrestling with from mass incarceration to over criminalization to police violence be addressed when people of color hold the keys to both the courthouses and the prisons. Um, equally important, how could people of color harness technology to make policing both more efficient and more egalitarian? So to answer these questions, I looked to see how artists, cyber theorists, and speculative scholars of color, i.e. Afrofuturist and critical race theorist, have imagined the future. And um, with that said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time um, in my brief time talking about Afrofuturism or critical race theory. I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but suffice it to say that they both have certain principles um, for Afrofuturism and embrace of technology 
for both Afrofuturism and CRT, um, a goal of disrupting hierarchies along lines of race, gender, sexuality, class, whatever, that lend themselves well to my project of imagining policing in the year 2044. So in my article, I suggest that in a future informed by Afrofuturism and critical race theory, technology itself would likely contribute to a reduction in crime. So consider the technologies we already have and the future technologies we can imagine. So for existing and emerging technologies, think of the likely exponential increase in the use of surveillance uh, cameras and eye in the sky technology. Think of the perception of facial perfection. I'm sorry, think of the perfection of facial recognition technology and other biometric technologies. Uh, think of the likely instantaneous access to big data, uh, the use of remote scanners to detect unlawful weapons, the widespread availability of short range communication devices to obviate the need for traffic stops, um, or even the availability of self-driving cars that um, obviate the need for traffic stops. Uh, think of the potential likely uh, collection of DNA data from every newborn um, or machine learning. All of this, I argue, can contribute to deterring criminal activity and improving apprehension. Um, so first things first is just imagining what the future holds as we embrace more technology. We also make the argument that such technologies can even reduce um, um, unequal policing. And, you know, I'm just going to focus right now on um, unjustified police violence, especially as it impacts Black and Brown communities. So increased surveillance alone um, is likely to deter some police conduct uh, violence, but it could more importantly document police violence on the back end. Um, and even more importantly, um, I argue in my paper that technology has the potential to reduce the use and need for excessive force. So scanners, for example, could tell police whether the suspect is armed or not. Facial recognition technology combined with access to big data could tell the police whether somebody has a history of nonviolence or not, um, and thus reducing the risk of escalation. We could even imagine technologies that allow police to disable weapons from a distance. Beyond this, um, I argue that technologies might be our best hope of overcoming the human biases we all know about. So we can imagine technologies that move us closer to real reasonable suspicion, so that looks, encounters, stops, and frisk turn on actual reasonable suspicion rather than the proxy of race, um, or even the ball from Etienne of, of the proxy of blackness as you know, fighting words. Um, so as I've written, um, um, in my article, you know, you could imagine weapon scanners potentially telling the police that a bulge in a black teenager's pocket is nothing more than an old fashioned cell phone. Um, but the, the, the white tourist who looks like he's from Texas really does have a gun. Um, facial recognition technology with access to big data could tell the police that the brown driver repeatedly circling the block in fact, works for the neighborhood, works in the neighborhood and is probably looking for a parking space. And that the clean gut, clean cut guy sitting in the park bench is in fact a registered sex offender too close to the playground. Um, so in a way that's not a, intrusive, it would tell the police whether somebody's a troublemaker, casing a neighborhood or a student returning home with a bag of Skittles and an iced tea, a burglar about to commit a home invasion robbery or Harvard professor entering his own home, um, a thug with a gun or a police chief, a trespasser attempting to enter the Capitol building or a US Senator, a mugger looking for his next victim or future US uh, Attorney General. Um, and all of these are, are based on actual cases. It would also tell them that the white kid from Jersey who's driving around Harlem is not there to score drugs, but to see his black girlfriend. So the technologies I'm referring to, um, I think, could be embraced in a future informed by Afrofuturism and critical race theory. Uh, these technologies that I'm referring to are likely to be consistent with Afrofuturism's embrace of technologies that disrupt hierarchies along lines of race and gender. And they can certainly help deracialize policing and the kind of, you know, 
discretion that has long been a concern of critical race theory. So I'm gonna um, say a few words right here um, um, about policing and technology because usually this is where I get pushback from audience members. And the first pushback um, I usually get is why should we trust technology when the technologies we have seem to replicate and even exacerbate um, current racial inequalities. Um, and people like refer to facial recognition technology or risk assessment algorithms. And, you know, I concede that point. Let's be honest, the current state of technology has a race problem, which is not surprising, bias in, bias out. Um, and I also readily acknowledge that technology has been anything but an innocent bystander when it comes to things like mass incarceration. So there's a cultural critic and digital artist by the name of Netrice Gaskin, who says, historically, people of color have been casualties of technologically enabled systems of oppression, um, a quote that I like. Um, and I also like a quote from uh, Ruha Benjamin, uh, the sociologist and futurist at Princeton, who's coined the term the new Jim Code a play on Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow to warn that technologies can perpetuate and exacerbate inequalities, especially when they have the veneer of being free from human influence and bias. But none of this suggests that bias technology is inevitable. Um, biases can be identified and eradicated or at least minimized. And I'm happy to talk more about this when we get to questions. So, but I will say like just, common sense, cameras do not automatically have implicit biases or suffer from unconscious racism, but people do. Um, so that addresses the first pushback I tend to receive. Point two is this, um, my project is not only about imagining technologies that have been purged of biases, it's also about imagining more diverse people at the table in creating technology and then saying what kind of technology we want. It's about imagining a bottoms up approach to technology rather than a top down approach. It's about imagining the benefits that will flow or could flow when racial minorities have the agency um, to actually produce technology, to create code, recode, drop a remix. Um, so to again borrow from Ruha Benjamin, what interests me is thinking about how techno science can be appropriated and reimagined for more just ends. Um, point three is this. I know I'm suggesting more surveillance um, and more technologies at a time when black and brown people are already heavily surveilled. Um, I know this project may sound privacy diminishing, um, but what's often missing in discussions of privacy is that privacy has never been equally distributed. Um, what excites me about my project is it has the potential to redistribute privacy such that those who have historically enjoyed um, a surfeit, an abundance of uh, privacy will enjoy a little less. And those people who uh, look like me, and I'll say Etienne, who've always been subjective to hard surveillance by police will face less. So at least we'll it'll go from hard surveillance by police to soft surveillance by cameras. So I know I'm leaving a lot of questions unanswered. I, I admit that in my paper, um, it sort of concludes with an acknowledgement that I'm leaving a lot of questions unanswered, such as how do we map a way to this future? Um, how do we make sure black and brown America does not simply replicate the inequality in policing that exists now? Um, how do we gird ourselves against uh, resistance uh, for people who want to maintain the status quo? Um, how do we prepare for the long game? Uh, these are questions I left open in 2018 when the article was published. And these are questions I'm still thinking about now. Um, and I will add another question um, prompted by this whole uh, event. How do we think about the future of policing? and the First Amendment, um, which is another reason I'm so glad I'm in this conversation with Etienne. Um, so um, I'm hoping we'll talk more about that during the q and I'm also hoping we'll talk a little bit about the storming of the US Capitol on January 6th. So somehow that seems to be in the background of everything we're talking about today. 
Um, but I will say the first step to thinking about all of these questions, at least for me, is thinking about the long game. Um, if we said to every black and brown and white parent out there, your children and grandchildren are going to live in a very different world, one that is far more diverse, where they have the potential to make the world a better place, where they truly have the ability to create a new country, where they have the ability to create and harness the technologies they want, how would we prepare our children and grandchildren differently? Like how would we prepare them now to be ready to inherit that future? Um, so that's, that's my big question. So I will end there and I'm looking forward to uh, this conversation. All right, thank you so much. Um, speaking of questions, I do have about four of them prepared. Uh, and if we have some time at the end, we can always try and throw some other ones in from the audience or if y'all have other things. So this first one, this first question here is about protesting and it's directed more towards Professor Capers. And this was inspired by last summer's anti-police brutality demonstrations and how white protesters were visibly treated differently than black protesters. And it's interesting to think about what this dynamic looks like in this very colorful future that you describe. Um, and especially with uh, January 6th and all of those events that you've mentioned as well. So for you, what do you think the right to protest looks like in the future through your lens. So, so, and when you say the future, I'm gonna jump ahead to my imagined future 2044 and beyond. Again, when, you know, the script has flipped, people of color have numerical power, economic power, social capital power, um, what, what have you. Um, so uh, let me say up front that in my article, um, um, even though it focuses on policing, one thing I do say in the article um, is I, I try to encourage, I throw out something where I'm encouraging other scholars out there to apply Afrofuturism to other areas of the law. Um, so I'm loving that Etienne is, you know, willing to engage in a, not, not only a First Amendment scholar, but also talking about Afrofuturism, because I would love to see like how an Afrofuturist um, sort of imagines the First Amendment, including the fighting words doctrine and how that might be different, um, especially if they imagine a future where the Supreme Court looks different and, you know, uh, Justice Sotomayor is now Chief Justice Sotomayor and the Supreme Court is made up of, uh, you know, justices who are very diverse in terms of race, sex, class, disability, everything. Um, but that being said, um, I think if I imagine sort of a future of protest in this imaginary world, this future world, I also have to bring up technology. So again, if we're thinking about people of color harnessing technology, um, we're also sort of uh, thinking about how uh, that technology might be more egalitarian when it's being used by the police and also um, you know, useful when it's being used by other people. So if I could say something about technology in my answer, um, Itolf, uh, you know, again, I've already mentioned we tend to view often technology, especially surveillance as a negative, but we have to remember it also brought us the power of surveillance, the power to look back, to record what we see, to have what critical race theory scholar Lolita Buckner Innes calls the equivalent of a white witness, like somebody to vouch for people of color and say, that's what really happened. Um, and, you know, so I think tech has pluses and minuses. I just want to emphasize that. And clearly with the protests we saw last summer, we saw the government using technology. We saw them using drones to surveil and track protesters. We saw presumably the use of facial recognition technology, but we also saw technology being wielded wielded it by protesters and the media and other everyday citizens to record police behavior during those protests. So one immediate thought is on the policing end and on protest ends, everybody will be recording everyone. Um, and that in itself might be a positive because that's gonna reduce sort of like effed up behavior on both sides um, and also create a record, uh, a record um, for review later on but the other thing I have to say is, in my future world, uh, keep in mind there are 
fewer police officers. Uh, uh, defunding the police has sort of happened. There's more income equality. Um, there are actually fewer things to protest. So um, it's sort of interesting imagining a future world, like what happens, you know, how bad a protest going to be when there are fewer police and fewer things to protest, which might seem kind of Pollyannish, but that's the world I'm envisioning. Um, and the last thing I will say is my hope in this future world is that people of color, and I promise this is my longest answer to any of your questions, I hope. My hope is this in this future world, people of color who've experienced unequal policing would now be champions of equal policing. So the goal of critical race theory is eradicating sort of racial subordination. It's not enacting racial comeuppance. Similarly, with Afrofuturism, it's imagining a, a, a future free of hierarchies along multiple lines. Um, you know, so I think all of that will sort of benefit sort of how we think of protest and whether we even need protests going forward. Sorry to be long winded. No, it's okay. We love long winded answers here. So thank you. Um, our next couple questions get a little spicier. So this first one has to do with respectability politics um, and how a lot of conversations about policing involve a very whitewashed perspective of what behavior is appropriate, quote unquote. And it sounds like respectability politics both supports blackness being seen as fighting words or is the go-to go logic for proving why a victim deserves to be treated like a human being. So this one's more so for Professor Toussaint. How do we look critically at police interactions with Black people without using respectability politics? And what does that conversation look like? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for asking it. I think um, it begins by clarifying both the role and purpose of police officers um, doing so in conversation with communities and democratic discourse, and then using insights from those conversations to drive policy and reform, even when reform, and this is perhaps a hard pill to swallow for some, even when reform means abolishing some kinds of policing as we know it. Um, you know, currently, and this is how many of us experience policing growing up. We understand police as individuals who show up in our communities to enforce the law, to promote peace, to further quote unquote civility, to remove unwanted or dangerous people or, or kinds of behaviors, and to begin to disentangle how some of those dimensions are connected to respectability politics, I think we also, I think we need to connect uh, issues of race to issues of political economy, you know, because racism does not exist by itself. And I think this is, this is a really important point um, because it means, right, when some people say, we need to have a moral reckoning. We need to have some conversations about race. And if only everyone can understand how bad racism is, we can move past some of the issues that we face. Um, the reason why that falls flat and most people don't see that as the final solution is because there's a, there's a tight um, connection between racism and our political economy, which is, you know, which, which some might describe as sort of a racial capitalist economy. Um, there are ways in which racialism serves to perpetuate modes of labor exploitation, mo modes of uh, property expropriation in subordinated communities, modes of, of policing that, that, that serve economic goals. And so I think that is an important conversation to have. And I think that then would pull us into a much larger and more imaginative and perhaps more radical conversation that begins to challenge um, the, uh, the economic conception of man that sort of shrouds how we understand US political economy. And for this, I think it is important, although many politicians would have us not dive into history using lenses like critical race theory of the 1619 project as, as just two examples, I think it's really important that we revisit history because we will see that this economic conception of man that, that is the 
sort of predominant uh, framing of what it means to be human in these United States, you know, it is, is a more uh, recent uh, invention, so to speak, right? It, it, it came about during the Enlightenment period, supplanting what was then a more theological conception of what it means to be human. And I only raise these because I think then that conversation allows us to question a lot of our conversations around policing use economic language like efficiency, um, cost maximization or minimization. Um, and there are other conceptions that are equally important to um, democracy that should also be on the table. Words like equity, words like dignity, words like morality that are harder to fit into that economic sort of secularized framing of, of human being, thinking about human being as a kind of praxis. Um, and so I think having that more imaginative and broader conversation, one that might even push back on capitalism as we know it, so to speak, right? And think about the ways that capitalism as we know it perpetuates, um, you know, what, what many would call a genre of, of human being, right? Of a, a one vision of what it means to live in relation to one another. Um, I think then we can get a little bit deeper on the conversation about respectability and social order and, and peace and uh, freedom and, and think a little more imaginatively. Um, I think in that conversation, technology could, you know, be used as a lever for good. But unless we go to that point, we're going to continue to run into challenges where technology continues to just reify, you know, the same conversations that we're having. Thank you for that. I actually, since we have like a few minutes left, I'm really curious to hear Professor Caper's thoughts on this as well. And then we can maybe try and squeeze in one more question. So please go ahead. So that was just a, such a great answer from Etienne. I, I will just add to the uh, aspect on respectability politics. I think it's sort of interesting how much that, it seems like there's already been a shift in the, just the last few years. Um, you know, when we think about the response to George Floyd, it's sort of interesting how, um, even though the police were responding to the idea that he had a, a um, $20 bill um, that wasn't legitimate, uh, there wasn't the same demonization that we are used to with respect to black and brown people who are victims of police violence. So I think already people are like, okay, well, everybody deserves, you know, to go to what Etienne was saying, sort of dignity. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're middle class. It doesn't matter whether you're Henry Skip, Lewis Gates, like anybody deter uh, deserves basic dignity. I will also add, I think one thing that might be contributing to moving the needle on this is just uh, we have become a society that polices so much that it is hard <laughs> it is hard for anybody to sort of have sort of this respectability not anybody but basically it's off one in three Americans has been arrested <laughs> at some point so it's very hard now like almost everybody has the sort of taint um, of being arrested. So I think the idea like, oh, well, this person doesn't deserve protection because this person has a criminal history might also fall to the wayside simply because now everybody has a criminal history. All right, thank you. So for our last question, I'm gonna shift gears here and talk a little bit about critical race theory and gender differences. Uh, and the fact that a lot of conversations about policing and police brutality is centered around black men. And as someone who is not a man and for others who aren't men in the room, I'm interested in hearing about how both of you thought about other genders when you were writing your pieces or imagining the future. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just share briefly. I, I, it's such an important point. It's an important point, not only for policing, but also thinking about the first amendment. Cause I think in many ways, the concept of speech, right, whether it's pure speech or symbolic speech, is gendered in the United States. Um, the notion of what it means to speak freely, I would argue, stemming from, you know, the Constitution's origins and the First Amendment, was written through the lens of a dominant white male gaze. Um, and so I think when we talk about, you know, policing public square, um, almost on an unconscious level, 
uh, in ways that we don't fully grasp, our minds immediately shift to thinking about a male experience of speech in that public gaze. When we think about policing speech, we think about encounters between men. Um, and to be sure, uh, there's a large percentage of police officers that are men. Um, but I think that also pulls in the dimensions of masculinity that become um, enacted in speech, in communication between uh, police officers and citizens. Um, but I think it is an incredible point to raise and to think about because the experience of women or the experience of, of, of different genders is, is silenced. Um, certainly in my piece is something that I thought about um, uh, and I thought a little bit about the way masculinity uh, colors the way that police officers, in particular police, uh, male police officers, interpret hostility, interpret defiance, interpret fighting words, so to speak, from citizens, right? And so the ways that gender and masculinity shapes how police officers interpret whether there, whether there has been a disturbance is incredibly important. Um, but I think it, it, it's also important on the flip side, right? How do women experience that, um, whether it's a female police officer or a female citizen? Um, and so I think it's an incredibly important point, you know, stemming from Kimberly Crenshaw, just thinking about the intersectionality of these issues. Um, and, I, and I hope that we continue to discuss it. And I, I will say, so I, I sort of take on a little bit gender issues and sexuality issues and class issues in my piece. Um, you know, I, as I say in my piece, there's a reason why Alondra Nelson describes Afrofuturism as a, as a feminist space. Um, and of course, there's a similar commitment, I think you could find in CRT. So in my future world, there's lots of diversity on police forces and police forces sort of look more like the country does. And they also sort of receive training on biases. There's virtual reality simulations where they get to experience being different. That being said, um, I don't mean to suggest that I think if you add a few black or brown people to police forces, they're going to be transformed. Or if you add more women to police forces, they're going to be transformed. Uh, all of those people can engage in uh, police abuses. All of those people could participate in sort of the blue wall of silence. But I do think if we imagine like a whole scale, like reimagining a police thing, um, then we can sort of capture sort of what we're interested in. There's one last thing I will say, just because it's, it's something I was not thinking about when I wrote my piece, but I'm thinking about it now, um, because in my piece, the word policing is in the title. And now I'm wondering, well, if we imagine a future where black and brown people really do have control, might they even retire the term police or policing, given that the police owe their sort of um, existence, their lineage to sort of slave patrols, to subordination, that might be that in this imaginary idealized future world, we're just creating whole new forms of ways of keeping everybody safe, ways of public safety. Um, it might just be simply changing the name or might be something more um, dramatic than that. But given the baggage that even the term police has, it might be in my future world, we're not even saying police, we might be saying something else. All right, thank you so much. So we are really running short on time and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, but there was one question that I wanted to ask from the Q&A real quick. And this question is, what will be the future for the intersection of Afrofuturism and First Amendment, Amendment scholarship uh, if and when different states succeed in banning critical race theory and make case law and jurisprudence about it? So I know we don't have a lot of time, but if y'all could just give your thoughts briefly, that would be great. I'm gonna let Etienne go first. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess to, to speak specifically to your question, if, um, if, if and when there are bans on teaching or discussing critical race theory, I think uh, Afrofuturism as a, as a discourse, I think will help us to think 
creatively about um, what what that looks like in the future and perhaps um, help to warn us about the dangers of going down that route, um, but also help us to imagine a very different future where critical race theory is a welcome part of schools of learning experiences of public discourse. Um, and so I see Afrofuturism continuing to play an important role there. Um, I think also Afrofuturism, in, in so doing, I think Afrofuturism also provides a different, um, and especially when we get to a point, as Professor Caper says, where we are majority minority, uh, helps us to think about a future where um, culture can help to shape how we think about and experience our political economy and the choices that we make, um, and perhaps how critical race theory plays a role in articulating what those different choices or different policies or different uh, approaches would look like uh, in practice. And I will just second what Etienne said. All right, thank y'all so much. So that brings us right at time. Again, thank you everyone for participating. This was amazing. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get through all of the questions, um, but yeah, thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and turn it to Kendra in case they have any last words before we close. Nope, just the uh, thank you, seconding Iltop and thanking Professor Tassant and Professor Capers for coming and joining us and for all of y'all for listening. Um, you know, in true IFRA uh, advertisement fashion, I have dropped the Twitter account and the newsletter link in the chat. So feel free to sign up um, and also to follow. Um, we've retweeted Professor Tassant and Professor Capers to follow them on Twitter um, if you want to hear more about the work that they're developing. And thank you, everyone, and have a happy Juneteenth to those celebrating. Thank you so much. Thank you.